bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. So this morning, may we truly be fed for manna, I pray in Jesus' name. All of us said, amen. All right. Okay, this one is entitled Friend of God, and we're dealing with uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Let's read a few verses from verse 19. If you don't have a Bible, one will be provided for you. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you to, into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you've received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached over all the world and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am going to make three points here today. And they all start with D. It's easy to remember. I know we're going like into uh, grade one s s set up. <laughs> you can remember it. So uh, the decoy, first of all. The decoy and the dilemma that we have. And then deliverance. So... And the decoy that I find in the, in, the, in the church today is that most people are putting this thing on Jesus, that their felt need. And our felt need is that we want to be happy, we want to be wealthy, and we want to be healthy. Eh? Happy, wealthy, and healthy. I like that. I think nothing's wrong with that. That's our felt need. When, whenever you, when you ask somebody, so what can we pray about? They usually come up with a, with this three or a combination of these three. I want to be happy. I want to be wealthy. I want to be healthy. And that's like fake Facebook language. If you're not on Facebook, if you want to know how to be happy, you go there. But nothing is wrong with it, as I said. But if Christ, he has the point. If Christ is supposed to do this, why did he suffer? What did he suffer for? He did not suffer, I don't think, to achieve this. I'm sure the Lord could have easily done this without shedding his blood on the cross and dying for us on the cross. How do I know this? Well, the Old Testament is proof of that. The Old Testament and the people of God were, in, in, in most cases, they were happy, healthy, and wealthy. He is called in the Old Testament, Jehovah Jireh, which means he is my provider. And he's Jehovah Rapha, who is the God who heals me. And it's Jehovah Shalom, where it might be well with me. That's his name, and we have his name. And so the Old Testament would have been enough to take care of those felt needs in the people. We didn't need Jesus to die on a cross for that. That is the decoy that I see in the church. The Old Testament, I believe, was not enough to reconcile everything. And God knows our real need felt needs and we have a real need and our basic problem 
is not just so that we're not happy, we're not wealthy, and we're not healthy. Our basic problem is sin. Sin is the problem. Put differently, Jesus and God knew that sin created death. We're going to die. It produced death in us. We deserve death. We deserve death. We are culpable because of sin. And the scripture says in the soul that sin shall die. So if we're, if we're preaching about health, wealth, and happiness, then we have a gospel that is a little bit foreign to the Bible. A little bit foreign. So the real thing, when you talk about Jesus and people try to put Jesus inside there, and I'm telling you, it's a decoy. It's a decoy. Because that's not our real need. And because of sin, God's wrath, his righteous indignation against sin is automatic. His wrath is automatic. In other words, he can't handle sin. He just can't have sin around him. Imagine, imagine a holy God living in us sinful people. It was not possible in the Old Testament. Not possible. What God did, he would visit his people once a year. Generally speaking, he would take care of them, but, but he would visit once a year, and that, he just doesn't come anyhow. He comes into the, the temple and the holy place and the most holy place, and that uh, somebody has to go there, and he has to take the, the sacrifices of the sins of the people and his own sacrifices the blood of the sacrifices and go into the holy place and they'll tie a um, rope to his ankles. He'd go in there and offer all of this on the mercy seat, physical mercy seat on, uh, in the temple. And then um, if, let's say he dropped dead because God didn't receive it, they will pull him out with a rope. But that I don't think has happened. But that was the deal. If he dies, and nobody else can go into the presence of the Lord because God was holy. Now, fast forward to the New Testament, you would have God, we say, is living in us. How come? If that same God was there and he was not happy with sin and we were his enemies, what happened now when we became his friends? How come? That is the real need. That is the gospel. See? That's the good news. Before it wasn't possible, now it is. I mean, it is this the gospel is not about, you know, being happy and wealthy and, and healthy. That's not the gospel. Uh, we might say, you know, um, yeah, when you come to Christ, you'll be happy. Well, don't say that because that's not the gospel. That won't, in a lot of cases, won't happen for lots of people. In fact, some worse things might happen. Hmm? Because you're dealing with the devil. Now, I know that book sells, but that's not the gospel. But yet at the same time, I believe that Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, the same God is with us and is able to take care of us. It will be well with us. He will want to prosper us and he wants to heal us. That's, that's the thing. But we, we can't get saved just on that Old Testament idea of who that God was. And, and we need something else, and we needed something else. And so there was a problem. We were going to die, and then we had God's wrath. That God's not happy, can't, he's holy, he can't have sin around him. And so we were by, we were by nature, as Ephesians and other books say, children of wrath. The Old Testament people kept getting into trouble, if you read the account. In the Old Testament, they kept getting into trouble with God. They would do all kinds of wrong things and God would take them out and take them, put them somewhere. All because they messed up so many times. Now when we preach the gospel today, we take those Old Testament ideas of what God was doing with those people and we make it the gospel. Decoy. We need to get the whole truth. We need to understand the whole Bible. So because of sin... And because we're in this state, this predicament, we were permanently separated from God. There's no way anybody can get to God, separated totally. 
So many are unaware that they are separated from God. Most people very glibly say, you know what, I'm, I'm a, a godly person. I don't steal. I don't, uh, you know, do the other wrong things. I'm, I'm a good guy. I think I will get there. Not by a long shot. What will get you there is what Jesus did. So how can we think that our need then is just to be happy, healthy, and wealthy? Hmm? And how many of this have this kind of gospel or combo of it? So in, 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 if my Christianity, is, therefore, is based on these things, I'm happy, wealthy, and healthy, then I might have constructed a Jesus of my own making. That's the problem. That's why it's a decoy. Because we've got another Jesus. We've got another gospel. Because that is not the gospel. And if you go preach the gospel, you're going to be happy. A lot of times you're not going to be happy because things can break up in your life, in your home. So this has become a decoy in the church. The enemy, of course, what he wants to do is wants us to surrender to him and look to him for our needs and, and all the while perishing and separated from God. If you remember, right in the very beginning, the enemy came to uh, Adam and offered food. Remember? Food. That's what he wanted to give him. A food that was forbidden. You remember in the wilderness, in the temptations of Jesus, what is the first thing he did? Why don't you turn the stones into bread? You're able to make the stones into bread. Satan wants to be the father of the nations. That's what he wants to do. He wants to feed all of us with the bread that is forbidden. He wants to feed us by his hand. And, 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 he, and, he think, and you think you won't be tempted? Imagine Jesus. He was tempted so much in that uh, three things that the enemy did. And in all of them, Jesus said, it is written. Firstly, the food. Turn the stones into bread. The lady took him up the temple and he says, jump from here and you know, the angels will take care of you. He's trying to kill him. And he says, no, you will not tempt the Lord your God. And then he took him to a high mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of the world. You know, there are a lot of people that have bowed down to Satan and are enjoying wealth in the world. Do you know that? Worldly wealth, wealthy fame. And then what we see and we read the books and we think that's the gospel. You know, why don't it happen for us? Look at these people. Well, it also has a hook in it. There's corruption in it. There's death in it. There's separation from God in it. All of that. And, and, and imagine Satan trying to present that to Jesus. Imagine that. Telling Jesus, I'll give you this. And all he wants is for you to bow down to me. That's all he wants. And the many I'm telling you, this is the decoy that have surrendered to him and all our needs. So you might think, well, uh, you know, whatever you've been blessed with something, sometimes you've got to have to ask, what is that? Where did it come from? If you have not been praying about something and suddenly things are going your way, you've got to ask, is this coming from the Father? And sometimes some people tell me, you know what, God has given me a wonderful thing or this thing or that thing. I'm, I'm going to go to this city or that city. And then immediately I ask, I say, at what price is this thing coming to you? Are you going to be away from your family? Yes. For how long? For so long. Really? And you think this is from God? Really? If you're going to another city for about two grands, I don't think that's even worth it, right? I think if they give you 20 grands more, maybe you think about it. But most often, a lot of the times, this is bread and forbidden bread being given to us. We need to always go back to our God and say, what are you thinking? So, point I'm making, this decoy is actually something that I wanted to produce, bring before you, so you can see it and watch this gospel that is being preached. 
And if a lot of people today are shouting prosperity, this, that, and the other, of course we know God wants to bless us. He would definitely bless you beyond your wildest dreams. I know that. God has done that to me in my life. But it, it doesn't leave you in the same place that he picks you up from. But that's not the gospel. It's part of it. It's a result of it. But it doesn't mean that, that, that if things, uh, if you're lacking, if things are not there, you don't have enough, that God is not with you. Now you've got to think again. So what is our real need? What is our dilemma? And our dilemma is that we have become enemies of God by our sin. If you really uh, look at your own life, if you have not really come to Christ, you don't know that Jesus is your Lord, then it's very likely that you have become an enemy of God. Well, that's strong words to say. Just by your sin. What happened to us as a result? That that is a great... What has happened to us? That's a great question. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked... You're asking the question, so what happened to us? Firstly, death came to all of us. Secondly, God's wrath. The holy God cannot look on, on sin. You remember on the cross, Jesus being there and dying on the cross, and the Father looked away. If you remember, Jesus was saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? Remember that one? Well, that's what you're saying. You're looking at the sins of of the world, every corruption that you can ever think of, every rape, every uh, murder, everything that you can think that the enemy and the, and the people of the world are, are committing was on Jesus at that time. And, and Father could not look on his son. He saw the sin. But there was a bigger picture and the Lord knew what he was doing. He took our, our sins, the chastisement of our sin, was on him. He took it for us. So death is the result. God's wrath is the result. Separation is the result. Those are our needs. That's, that's the big problem. We separated from God. We are in bondage to sin. Some people can't help it. You know, they're, they're so broken by sin. And they say, you know what, I don't know how I can get out of this. Well, it's a bondage. That's what it is. That's our problem. That's our dilemma. How do we get out of it? People can't get off and out of habits that are simple habits, yet, yet there are very um, hectic habits because they are abusing uh, substance of, of any kind and every kind. I'm telling you that that is bondage. There's bondage in our lives. We're separated from God. We don't have God. Don't kid yourself. If you're just being happy, wealthy, and happy, wealthy, and healthy, that is not, you can't say that's God. Even the devil will do that to his people. That's my point. He'll keep you happy, keep you wealthy, and whatever else. He can do that. Jesus didn't need to die, whether because the Lord knew what our real problem was, he came to our rescue. So, put another way, this is our dilemma. We deserve to die. We deserve to die as a penalty. We deserve to bear God's wrath and we are separated from God and we are bondage. So, as human beings then, uh, born of Adam, we have all of these things and these four needs had to be met by Jesus or, or we're sunk. So, what did Jesus do on the cross? And what he did, his work is very complex. And what happened on the cross and what he did has been described in the Bible, and I don't want to uh, give all the details of it, but just to tell you the four things that he did to meet our four needs. We're in so deep that we don't know our own need, yet we are drowning, and yet our Lord knows uh, that, we, that, uh, that uh, what our problem is, and he's doing something about it. The point is we are so far away, we don't know we're friends. I don't know about you, but do you reckon you're, you're a friend of God, really? You think that you, that you love God and that God's, um, forget the word love, that the word is a little bit overused, but think about the word friend. Are you, you think that you're friends with God. 
That's a good question to ask. Is God your friend? Are you at peace with God? I'm not talking about a nice feeling because even yoga and all the other things can give you that. If you go to the chalet and have chicken, you can curry and all that and relax. On in the chalet, you might get a little bit of peace. Right? I'm not talking about that. I am talking about peace with God. Can you maybe take the child to the back or, or into the room, please, if you don't mind? There's a room here for you. Yeah. Because it's also disturbing some other people around you. And so we're not talking about peace, a nice feeling. We're talking about peace where you are no longer an enemy. You're not an enemy with God. God's your friend. I tell you, that is quite a thing. There was a missionary guy his, and his wife. The name's uh, Don and Carol Richardson. And they, they moved into the jungles of New Guinea. That's, they, that's where they were. And so in this jungle, there were tribal wars. And three tribal villages were in constant battle at that time. So the Richardsons were considering moving out of that uh, area because of this war, any time they could even die. So, so the Maui people, Sawi people, to keep them there uh, in those uh, embattled villages, came together and decided that they would make peace with their hated enemies. And the way they were going to do it, this, ceremonies commenced in which the young children from each tribe were exchanged between the opposing villages. One man in particular ran toward the enemy camp and literally gave his son to his hated foe, took his son and gave it to the, the enemy. And observing this, this guy Richardson said, if a man would actually give his own son to his enemies, that man could be trusted. Gave his own son. So what did God do? We were enemies. We had a need we deserve to die, we are dying, and we are far away from God, separated. God had to do something. So what did he do? He gave his son for his enemies, all of us. He gave his son so that the son will bring peace between God and his people. No God has done that. No God has done that. Go around and ask. In Isaiah 9, it says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So again, Father gave his son. The son laid his life down. He, and he says it like this. No man will uh, lay down his life. How does it go? No man can say he loves without him laying down his life. He laid down his life for his friends. This is Jesus laying down his life for his friends. And so the New Testament describes four different things. And the, and the one is sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, Jesus himself. He is the gift. And not only that, he is the propitiation, the Bible says, for this offering that he presented. It's the very act of presenting the offering he also did, where he gave himself. He offered himself, and he was the offering. He offered himself. And he took the offering, and he, it was him. He laid his life down on the mercy seat of heaven. You remember when he, was, uh, when he arose, somebody came to see him, Mary, I think it was. And, and, and Mary came to uh, touch him. And he said, Mary, don't touch me, because I have not ascended to my father yet. You remember that? And then later on, in this, he, he, was, he was talking to his disciple. Put your finger here and see uh, a, a spirit wasn't, doesn't have flesh and bones and so on. Between that time and that time, he had already gone up to be with the father. What do you do? 
he presented himself he presented his sacrifice he presented the offering the blood on the mercy seat of heaven and so in heaven you read of uh, there's no other sacrifice available but that which is on the altar the blood of jesus is there you can't go and trample the scripture says you're trampling on the blood of jesus you can't walk away from that that's what god has done and there you are it's been offered for you and what also has happened and those two things together the sacrifice and the act of offering the sacrifice is called atonement he made atonement for us he reconciled us that day he reconciled us father and people people can come home through christ now god can go in and live in every one of them god can actually live in us and that's why you know um, there's this this no religion on earth that has ever done something like that for us nobody nothing and so the religions of the world will talk about happiness wealth and happiness but but none of this other stuff that's our real need that's our real need no longer are we slaves no longer are we enemies of god but now friends with god this is the deliverance and his work met each and every need in the word atonement is a very simple word uh, actually it's an at at one meant atonement at one meant making at one god made us together made us one is a process of bringing us into union with god and this atonement uh, does two things first of it turns god's wrath away god is not angry at us anymore not angry at all and then god looks upon us favorably we're not enemies any longer right in the very beginning if you would go back to that colossians chapter and let's read that verse again with that in mind and then we'll try and land and it says in verse number uh 20 then through him god reconciled everything to himself he made peace with everything jesus did in heaven and on earth by means of christ's blood on the cross this includes you who were once far away from god you were his enemies notice past tense you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions yet now he has reconciled you present tense or a done deal past tense he has reconciled you to himself through the death of christ in his physical body as a result he has brought you into his own presence couldn't do it before old testament couldn't do that before but now you've been brought into his own presence and you are holy and blameless imagine that look at yourself in the mirror and say samuel you are blameless can't believe it right even if you said that to your neighbor today sitting here i want you to just look at your neighbor and look back don't say anything look at them and look back at me that alone will tell you when that person look at you thinking ah right but i want you to know if you are in christ this is what father has done he's made you blameless he's made you holy imagine that you're holy holy is, has very little to do with in how good you are this is a a a status this is a place with god sanctified you word means separated doesn't mean now okay i can i can live like the devil no it means that that's your status why do i want to go and mess myself up in the mud i already had a shower hmm? Yeah, the pause means uh, it's not like I don't have anything to say. I'm waiting for it to sink. I can see that it in your computing and all of that. 
but then you are holy and blameless as you, as you stand before him. And then it says, even if you missed all that, without a single fault. You know, nice to say to your wife, you remember what God said? You know, or your husband, that is. You say, oh, God looks at me without a single fault. Don't pick on my past. <laughs> Don't pick on what I did last year. I have no fault. Mm. Then verse 23 eh, kind of puts a bottom line and he says, but you must continue to believe this truth. Believe it means live it and stand. There it is. Stand firm. Stand firmly in it. Let's not just be like a, a, a mind a mental uh, gymnastics. You've got to believe it and stand firm. Don't drift away from the assurance you received. Don't leave this place today and think, well, I can live like I want. No, you can't live like you want. He says, That's what got to me when I was in drugs in those days. I mean, I was a mess, right? I was quite an idolater as well. I was a mess. I got to the place where God didn't exist for me. All of that. I had to be under the light of God's word. So when I would read this kind of stuff, and I think, wow, God is busy working with me. And I, not only could I just read it, but I was experiencing this before I went to church, reading the Bible outside of the church. And God was drawing me. And I could tell that I was fast becoming his friend. And that my prayers were not hitting the ceiling and coming back. Yeah. But then I couldn't drift away. I was going more and more closer. I was, getting, I was, I was sinning a lot yesterday. I was sinning less today. And I know I was going to sin less tomorrow. That is the gospel, by the way. Hmm. It got nothing to do with how good you are. God is busy working. It's the Lord working. What he did on the cross is not just to be, you can be happy, wealthy, and healthy. God is working. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. So our, our dilemma is that we are sinful and, and, uh, and sinful and uh, uh, unholy people, we can't have fellowship with a holy God. But God, the solution was forgiveness. And the way he was going to do it, the, the old sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't work. So his son came. We're talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus? We're talking about Easter, Passover. So remember the decoy. Whenever you hear this thing, if the guy is not talking about Christ and his death and the work that he's done, and if that's all you hear on being happy, you know, sometimes when people pray these things, you must remember that God always wants you to be happy. And that, in fact, happy is not the word. What is the word in the Bible? Joy. Right? Joyful. And, and he says, even in your, in, your, in your trials, you must be joyful. He said that, Happiness is what the world wants. And I want to be able to rejoice. Wealth, well, I want to make sure my needs are met, right? And so if you don't have your needs met, you will ask God for it. Correct? And I want to be healthy. And so the enemy want to feed us with all those distractions. And some people actually teach this on a regular basis. And they, um, you know, are selling books very, very quickly. So the, but the real need and the, and the dilemma that we're in is that we are facing certain death. We are facing God's wrath. We are facing separation from God. We are living in bondage to sin. We can't get out. I'm telling you, it's not hard to get out of your habits. Not hard at all. Not hard. In the light of all this, you can go to God and say, I want to break this. Now, Jesus that is living in you, you remember... I had drugs leave me before I went to church while I was still reading the Bible. So I know what I'm talking about. 
before I went to church, before anybody laid hands on me, stuff left me because I brought those things before the Lord. You can be free. You don't have to live in bondage to sin. Right? I love you, man. And God has made atonement for you so that you'll be delivered and be friends again. He has, recon- he has reconciled everything by redeeming us. And that's why we can say we are what? Saved. You're talking about being saved? That's what it means. Now tell me what I said today. Today. Stand with me, please.